Um, it's great to have him here. So Moby and uh, Mr. David Lynch. Hello. Um, it's very quiet. <laughs> um, so let's start. Is anyone hungover? Because I figure there are a lot of Brits here. You're in LA, between Coachella. Okay, I'm not, because I have chosen failure via sobriety. Um, How are you, David? Good, Mo. So, a few years ago, um, I, for the David Lynch Foundation, I assume everyone's found familiar with the David Lynch Foundation? Yes? Well, would you like to say something about the David Lynch Foundation? Uh, the David Lynch Foundation was formed in 2005. We uh, have some fantastic donors. We raise money to give uh, the life-transforming benefits of Transcendental Meditation to any student anywhere in the world that wants it. And then it branched out to veterans suffering with post-traumatic stress disorder, Native Americans suffering from diabetes, prisoners, people suffering from ADD, ADHD, bipolar, all kinds of things. So um, they get um, a big relief and a lot of happiness when they get this technique of transcendental meditation. Um, so there was an amazing fundraiser for the David Lynch Foundation at Radio City Music Hall um, with about the best, strangest lineup you could imagine. It was Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, um, Ben Harper, Ben Harper, Eddie Vedder, My Morning Jacket, uh, me, Moby, <laughs> um, Howard Stern, and Jerry um, Seinfeld. Jerry Seinfeld. One of my favorite moments of the night, though, was after the performance. We were at a dinner somewhere, and Bill O'Reilly came up to you, and. I was just like, why is Bill O'Reilly at an event for Transcendental Meditation? Well, I'll tell you, I was very surprised to see him, and he came up to me, shook my hand, and said, David, I really like what you're doing for the children, for the students. So there you go. And then he went out back and strangled a puppy. <laughs> um, no, he didn't. So, so before the fundraiser at Radio City, you interviewed the performers? Do you remember when we yes. went to SIR Studios? Yes. And you interviewed me, and basically the entire interview consisted of us talking about old factories. Mm -hmm. um, so, in turn, now, um, I was going to interview you. It's beautiful, Mo. So, being professional, I've written down a whole bunch of questions. Um, absolutely none of them have anything to do with the world of entertainment, music, or electronics. Well, sort of they do. Maybe one does. So. Should I start? So I started now. Okay. Um, you know what I might do? Sound perspective is move the mic over here because I'm looking this way. Is that better? Sort of? No. Is everyone bored? No? Okay. There's still time. Um, okay, so question number one. Sure. What's your favorite birthday meal? My favorite birthday meal. Yeah. If today was your birthday and you were going out to dinner tonight, what would be your perfect birthday meal? Keeping in mind this is a conference about electronic music. <laughs> I would like um, for my birthday meal to have scrambled eggs with cheddar cheese, Ooh. hash browns, crispy fried bacon, almost burned, super crispy, uh, white toast with butter and red jam and lots of coffee. Okay. That was question number one. Question number two, and this is a leading question because I actually sort of do know the answer. Have you ever grown maggots successfully? Have I ever grown maggots successfully? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't actually grown them. I've laid the foundation for them to appear and grow. And I did this one time, I was working on a painting, and the painting is called Rat, Meat, Bird. And so the meat uh, was a slab of beef 
about three inches thick by nine by nine and I let the meat go out in the yard and uh, little by little um, the meat expanded and within it maggots were growing and I had a thing going that was pretty fantastic uh, but one night uh, the next night I think a coyote got uh, the top half and uh, that uh, kind of stopped the the, the maggot experiment. Yeah, we should probably just stop there. I mean, it's all downhill. It's, it's downhill from here. Yeah. Um, okay. I like the uh, things growing, mm -hmm. and then on the other side, things decaying. And both 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 processes are are interesting, uh, texturally and visually. Uh, like that. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a question. It's also a leading question. Um, is Inland Empire my favorite movie of the last 10 years? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> um, have you ever done yogic flying? Yes, I am a yogic flyer. Not a great one, but uh, in Transcendental Meditation, uh, Transcendental meditation is a mental technique, and it is its own thing. Ancient form of meditation brought back by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. There's another technique, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, completely different thing. And this is planting an idea at a very deep level and seeing what sprouts. And if you plant the idea, uh, you get a result. And the result in what they call yogic flying is you lift off the ground, you pop up. And um, if, if things were a little bit more pure in the world, you could uh, hover. And if things were very, very pure in the world, you could actually fly. And because I know in Fairfield, Fairfield, Iowa is the sort of the world center of TM. Is that safe well, to not, say? Not necessarily in America oh. it is. Okay. So it's the American Center for TM. Well, it's a community where lots of meditators are. Okay, and I know that yogic flying happens there. Yes, the the beautiful thing about uh, this world, this this whole show, is that at the base of all matter and mind, there is a field that quantum physics calls the unified field, the big treasury ocean of consciousness, being, the kingdom of heaven, the Tao, home of total knowledge, home of all the laws of nature, uh, the self with a capital S, know thyself. This is this treasury within every human being at the very, very deepest level. And contacting that deepest level, Experiencing that means you can infuse some and grow in that, expand consciousness and all positive qualities. And one of those qualities is peace. So people experience more and more inner peace. And this technique of yogic flying and all the other sutras done in a group, it magnifies that peace. It, 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 magnifies the effect of that within the individuals and actually helps raise collective consciousness, brings peace to collective consciousness, brings harmony, bliss, good feeling to uh, people who don't care about meditation even. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing and they say that if, when real peace ever comes it will be because this field within is enlivened in the midst of diversity. Unity enlivened in the midst of diversity is peace. And the uh, result is negativity goes away and it's, it's all, you know, uh, positive. <laughs> Once again, we should just stop there. <laughs> um, um, would you like to grow quinoa in your backyard? I'd like to grow a lot of things. Um, and it's um, this thing about food, they, they say the air is kind of bad and the water is kind of bad and the earth is kind of bad, the food is bad. So quinoa is this 
uh, grain that is very high in protein. It's very good. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to grow it, but it's kind of a magical um, thing, quinoa. Well, it's interesting. As a vegan, um, I love quinoa because it's one of the only grains that actually has a full complement of amino acids. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And it tastes great. It does taste great. And it's bulletproof. Like you cook it in about 15 minutes. 20 minutes it takes 15, about. Yeah. yeah. And like you just, you just can't fuck it up. No, it's, it's great stuff. And if you look at it close, it's like an entire little planet, like with a little thing wrapped around it. It's beautiful, Mo. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, randomly, are you familiar with the work of Jack Smith, the filmmaker? Jack Smith. No, I don't believe I am. Okay. Is anyone here familiar with the work of Jack Smith? Paul Smith's brother. Crickets. Crickets. So Jack Smith was an experimental filmmaker in the late 50s, early 60s, and he influenced Fellini. Like, Juliet of the Spirits is kind of an homage to Jack Smith, and he influenced uh, Andy Warhol. Um, so that's my recommendation. If you're bored, look at this movie. It's called Jack Smith and the Evolution of Atlantis. And he... It's a little bit dark. He was a performance artist as well, and his last performance, this is very dark, especially for a Thursday morning in this nice environment, his last performance was to contract HIV and die. So he went out with the intention of becoming HIV positive and dying of AIDS. But, on a happier note, his earlier films are very beautiful. Is it Wednesday? Wednesday. I've had a lot know. of coffee. I'm tired, too. Um, it's Wednesday? Oh, okay. It's Wednesday. Great. That, changed, that changes the line of questioning. Um, okay. So, recently, I saw um, a Lost Highway at the Cinerama Dome, and it was beautiful. Um, and I was thinking, like, Lost Highway, I mean, this is a very obvious statement. Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, Inland Empire, the stars of these movies are Los Angeles. And so I was going to ask you if you'd like to answer it, what is your relationship with LA and why and how has it inspired, why has it been such a central character in so many of these movies? Well, uh, Los Angeles, my main love of Los Angeles is the light, the sunlight in LA makes me feel very, very good and happy. And there's something about L.A. being spread out that gives me a feeling of freedom. And that um, anything goes. You're free to think and, and do things. This is a feeling. Mm -hmm. And I love the night-blooming jasmine smell. Oh, boy, yeah. And when I smell the night-blooming jasmine, I... And, it, and there's a little breeze, it blows in a feeling of the golden age of cinema. And I can feel all of that um, in different places in LA. It's very beautiful. And like they say, um, a city is always changing. It's always feeding you ideas. You can never capture the thing uh, in a film, just a piece of it, but it's an inspiring place. Um, the idea that uh, cinema, you know, was so huge here, it's, um, it's just got uh, this, this possibility to realize your dreams. Um, I think as a little bit of geographic trivia, the first movie studio was about 100 yards from here, right at the corner of Gower and Sunset. Really? I think so. Huh. Um, does anyone... Any L.A. historians? No? You people are worthless. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a good bunch mode. No yeah. easy. It's a <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Apart from here, where in the world is your favorite place? Paris, France. Okay. Do you want to think about it some more? <laughs> 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 um, I asked about Inland Empire being my favorite movie of the last 10 years. The answer was yes. Um, oh, here's a good one. Ready? 
And some of these are leading questions. When was the last time you used your microscope and why? I love this microscope. And have you ever looked at pond water in a microscope? Because if you haven't, it's great. I believe... Uh, I believe I looked at semen. Mm -hmm. As have I. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I too have looked at semen. <laughs> I think a lot of people look at semen. It's amazing. When I looked at semen, my semen under a microscope, there was this just sense of sadness. Because, <laughs> I mean, each person here is the result of one little sperm cell. And all of your parents, all of your dads, ejaculated thousands of times, each time ejaculating a Hundreds of millions of sperm cells. I don't know if there's hundreds of millions more. Okay. <laughs> and all those little sperms, when you look at them on a slide, they all are moving. They all want the same thing. They're happy. And, and none of them, you know, most of them just end up on the floor. <laughs> um, if you ever have a high power microscope, go to a pond and take like an eyedropper of pond water and put it on your little slide and put the little cover lid on it. It's amazing. It's a universe in a dropper of water. Sure. Like all these crazy like paramecium and protozoa just going nuts and eating each other and battling <laughs> in a tiny little bit of pond water. Um, if, some, if Paul Allen, who is a billionaire, gave you Fifty million dollars to start a museum. What would you want to put in the museum? Well, I would like to find um, new new painters that hadn't gotten a chance and uh, start there. Okay, so new painters. Yeah, new painters. Okay, here's, and forgive me if this is an awkward question. If, if it's an awkward question, please say, Mo, that's an awkward question, let's move on, because I have lots of other questions. <laughs> They're all awkward questions, because I'm an awkward person. Um, so, the preamble to the question is that I think we can agree that the TV show Twin Peaks was sort of like, has heralded this what we'll call like the weird quasi-golden age of television. You know, like it was the first truly sort of like compelling, idiosyncratic, odd TV show. And I, I think without it, you like wouldn't have True Detective, you wouldn't have these other very odd idiosyncratic TV shows. As there has been this move towards interesting TV, have you been tempted to write or develop uh, a new TV show? Mo, that's an awkward question, and I'm not going to answer it. Okay. So if you were developing a TV show, what... <laughs> um, okay. Oh, this is music related. Um, do you have... I want to ask you a question, Mo. Okay. The TV show Twin Peaks mm -hmm. inspired you in some way. Yeah. And can you tell us um, how that came to be, uh, the track Go? Okay. So I had written a song called Go that was this very minimalist techno song. And we licensed it, and it came out, and no one cared. And we licensed it to... a record label in the UK called Outer Rhythm. And they asked for a remix. And I was thinking, what can I do for a remix? And I was obsessively watching Twin Peaks. And I heard Laura Palmer's theme. 
And I thought, huh, I wonder if I could play Laura Palmer's theme over the top of this song. And I originally wanted to sample it and steal Laura Palmer's theme. But unfortunately, I wasn't technically savvy enough to know. I didn't have enough sampling time, because it's quite long. Mm -hmm. So I had to replay it, which saved me a lawsuit. Uh, I tried to steal it. I, I really did. You did ask, I thought you did ask. The publishing. Oh, publishing, OK. But I tried to steal the recording you tried of to it, steal it, and I just wasn't clever enough to do that. So I played Laura Palmer's theme on top of this dance track, and we released it, and it became a big, <laughs> successful song. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, Twin Peaks inspired me in so many different ways. And I remember, so Fairfield, Iowa, um, we were there together. With Laura Dawn and Darren and, yeah. and the gang, yeah. And we did a couple of concerts and we had, I had, okay, so the first night we had a concert and then we went to the Fairfield, Iowa prom. That's right. Where you and Donovan and I serenaded the graduating class yeah. <laughs> of 2008, I think, and there were about graduating class of 15. They went crazy for Mo. <laughs> And Crazy. then you all, this was before I stopped drinking, so you all went home to go to sleep, which mm -hmm. was a sensible thing to do. And I went out and got drunk and did rot gut crystal meth with the locals. <laughs> um, ended up at a house party at 6 o'clock in the morning, went back to my hotel at 7 or 8 in the morning, gobbled a whole bunch of Xanax and Vicodin, slept through until about 6 p.m. I was supposed to be getting like a massage, Ayurvedic oil treatments, instead I was passed out in my bed, hung over on uh, Xanax and Vicodin. But while I was in my sort of fugue state, influenced by alcohol, drugs, and more drugs, and more drugs, um, I had this realization, and all of a sudden I saw Bob from Twin Peaks. And drugs I, will do that to you. And I, and I saw Bob, and I was like, I was like, he doesn't, he's not, evil. He doesn't want to be evil. That's, that's a, isn't that the truth? And then the next night, Sunday night, all hung over and crazy, I was on stage and I stopped the concert and I looked at you and I said, I understand Bob. <laughs> 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 and I, I felt like I did. That's beautiful. That's Thanks. a great story. <laughs> to that end, are you familiar with the molecule DMT? No, I'm not, Mo. Okay, it's the, is anyone here familiar with DMT? Finally, a few hands go up. So DMT, it's the, it's the psychoactive component in ayahuasca. What is this, the mushroom or something? It's a, yeah, it's a rainforest psychedelic drug. I've never done it. Uh -huh. But on DMT, it's also called the spirit molecule. Uh -huh. And it's present in the pineal gland of our brain. Sure. And apparently, during birth, orgasm, death, the brain is flooded with DMT. Um, so my question was, do you have any thoughts on DMT? <laughs> yes. But, well, they say that um, all these experiences uh, we can have and they just need to be unfolded. When you get more and more consciousness, you're little by little making the subconscious conscious. All these things, these experiences that drugs provide will come and um, this, this bliss grows, bliss and energy and this feeling of being so happy in your body, so happy in the work, it's all there within each one of us. The drugs give you a, sh a picture of it, of experience, but you don't own that. And your body p play, pays a kind of a price mm -hmm. that you could probably tell us about, Mo. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <laughs> But this DMT, it sounds like the name of a group in a, mm -hmm. in a way. <laughs> or a rapper. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so here, this might be an awkward question. If so, we've already established precedent for awkward questions. For sure. Um, what are your ideas for your next record? Oh, well, I work with Big Dean Hurley here. And um, to come out here, Dean. And, <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Dean and I... Um, we have we just barely started, and we like uh, the blues, and and so in in a very general way, that's uh, what is is inspiring to us. And uh, we jam to start a thing, mm -hmm. and we try to find some little speck of gold 
in these jams and then build on that. So we, we haven't um, really uh, gotten going on the next one, but it will start with a jam very soon. Um, is the slide guitar that I gave you for Christmas a few years ago the best present you've ever received? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, why? <laughs> <laughs> One, it was so kind of you to give that to me, and this slide guitar that you gave me has an incredibly beautiful sound. I just am, uh, you know, in the early stages of learning it, mm -hmm. and but it's a thrill to play that guitar. Um, what are some of your favorite sounding records uh, made by other people that you love? I like. Um, uh, in Monterey Pop, Big Brother and the Holding Company, Janis Joplin, Ball and Chain. Mm -hmm. I like the sound of all of that. And Janis Joplin's voice is like an instrument. It's so, it can be so soft, it's so cut through, so much power was in that voice. At that same Monterey Pop, Otis Redding sings I've Been Loving You and it's one of them, I just, I burst into tears when I hear this song. I cannot believe what he's able to bring out. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it. Jimi Hendrix, Monterey Pop. Unreal uh, what the, he was doing and how incredible him and his guitar are one. And it just, he just is walking power and, and, and music so beautiful. Elvis Presley drives me crazy. Buddy Holly, the Everly Brothers, this harmony, this tight, they're this like, like they say, is it one voice? It, it sounds like one voice, but mm -hmm. it's not. They were so in tune. There's so many great things out there in the world. Uh, the Fleetwoods, Come Softly. I love this song. We talked about the, the Ronettes. The Ronettes, uh, you know, like, we could just keep naming one after another. There's so much uh, power and great uh, things. The Shangri-Las and uh, let's see, I like Mazzy Star. I like the feel of ma that. And I like, what else do I like, Dean? <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Neil Young, Young made, uh, maybe it's not his last album now, but it was a recent album with Daniel Lenoir. Mm -hmm. And on this, they filmed Neil singing each track. So uh, this one track I love so much, uh, and the filming of it is beautiful too, but Neil Young playing a guitar singing Love and War. And you can see this on YouTube. It's black and white. And listen to his voice and the lyrics, but also the, the guitar sound and how he plays this guitar. It is... I think, beyond the beyond, uh, great. Um, over the years, you've been interviewed many times. Generally, is it a process that you enjoy? No. Okay. <laughs> if there was a question that you could be asked right now, what would the question be? Would you like to go home? <laughs> so, David, here's my question. Would you like to go home? <laughs> no, I'm happy to be here. Okay, good. <laughs> um, let me think. Based on your experience with the unified field, do you have a personal idea of who or what God is? Yes. <laughs> um, the good news, this is what I hear, not so much what I experience, but what I hear is that you've heard the expression where it sparks off the divine flame. So it gives you something to think about. And in my mind, um, we are that. Uh, they said that God was lonely, so he multiplied himself. 
And these sparks, we just go way, way out. We go way, way out and we get lost in the field of relativity. And the trick is to find your way home. And finding your way home, you can, it might take a long, 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 long time. But uh, we all will find our way home and we will sit at the feet of the Lord as masters of all we survey. We will be, each of us, totality. Totality. 100% of everything unmanifest and 100% of everything manifest. And we will have zero possibility then of dying and there will be zero negativity and they say this is enlightenment and that's when life starts. I love that. My question seems so like provincial by comparison. <laughs> um, okay. So to that end, also a potentially awkward question. Do we fear death? Yes, we do. We fear death. Um, and a lot of times pain is involved with dying. And it's not death we, we fear. It's how long the pain is going to last before we die. And we always wonder where we're going to go. Uh, there's like they, I heard a man say there will always be people on earth that believe human beings have one life only. And there will always be people on earth that believe human beings have many, 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 many lives. I'm in the many, many, many lives mm -hmm. uh, feeling. And I believe consciousness is a continuum. So in some ways you never, you, and not in every way, you never die, it's a transformation. You drop the physical body, that's for sure. But you continue on. And there may be some events in between lives. They say we are judged by how we treat our fellow man. So you might experience uh, some level of what they call hell to get a feeling of the harm you did or the hurt you gave to others. Then you might experience some heaven to get the feeling of the joy you brought to others or the love you brought and the good things you brought. And then you might come around and meet some people that says, uh, Mo, are you ready to go back in? And you say, yes, I am. And then you sort of see what you're going to experience and you go in and you forget everything. And then you go again. They say if people remembered their past lives, they'd be afraid to go out of their house. Mm -hmm. um, sort of to that end, I have a, an undeveloped theory that part of life, sort of pursuant to what you were saying earlier, is the universe breaking off little pieces of itself. Because I mean, the truth is, every as far as we know, assuming there is something pertaining to linear time, the universe, let's say, is 15 billion years old. 13.7. 13.7 billion years old. Um, and there's not a single part of every person here that's less than 13.7 billion years old. Like all of our matter, all of our energy is 13.7 billion years old. And at one point we were all together in a spot of infinite density. And, but yet our experience is like, my experience is I'm 50 years old. That's my, ex and I have no recollection of those 13.7 billion years. So I wonder if it's the universe breaks off little pieces of itself in our form. We go out and have these experiences and then we're reunited with the universe to sort of bring our experience back to the consciousness of the universe. That's a sort of quasi theory that I have. That's not a good theory. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to that end, um, okay, if the world ended tomorrow, what would you want to do today? If the world ended, was going to end tomorrow. Just boom. Like an instant cataclysm where all of a sudden the world just ended. 
I would like uh, to spend this afternoon painting and maybe even a little bit into the evening and then um, have some red wine. Meditating before the red wine. I probably want to go back and meditate a bunch more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm trying to think, do I have any more questions? Is it bad, as an interviewer, that I haven't really asked you anything about um, your film work? No. Okay. <laughs> um, would you like me to ask you about <laughs> no, your film no, work? That's okay, Mo. What part of your film work should I ask you about? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Oh, I got a good one. Good deal. What are some of your favorite factories? Oh, that's a good question. I love factories, as you know. I, I love factories. I love to think about factories. I love uh, the, the imagined sounds of factories the textures, the fire, the smoke, uh, the, uh, all the utensils used in factories. And I love derelict factories, factories that have since, you know, that closed mm -hmm. down. And uh, the, the way nature is trying to reclaim the factories. And the textures in these places is, um, just beyond the beyond, the factories that were built in the 1800s are like cathedrals, the way they were built. And the machinery just has a beauty. So I found great factories in New York City and around New York City and New Jersey. I found factories in England. I found factories in France. I found factories in Germany and Poland. The Poland factories are, I've been in more of those, so, and they're very, very beautiful. So they may be my favorite so far. Um, and we've talked about this before, you know, I spent most of my life living in factories. Yes, um, yes. I left home and I moved to an abandoned factory that had made locks in the 19th century, this huge factory complex. And the floor that I, the whole place was primarily abandoned. And the floor that I was on had been repurposed during World War II to make film strips. And so I lived in this abandoned factory filled with old audiovisual equipment that didn't work. And it was about, like my floor was about 100,000 square feet. And I had this little space and no running water, no bathroom. Um, and I loved it. The smell of like, especially the brick, that combination like brick, concrete, and metal like iron, the way and they... And glass, right? And the way they age, mm -hmm. and the way the brick gets soft, and the iron gets soft, and it gets that patina of neglect. It's really beautiful. Yes, now where did you sleep? How did you sleep? Uh, I found some plywood in a dumpster, and the ceilings were really high, like maybe like 18-foot ceilings, and so I built a ladder. Well, it was a friend of mine built a ladder and then a plywood loft bed. And it was in the middle of a crack neighborhood. Did you sleep on the plywood or did you get a mattress? I had a mattress. Uh huh. There yeah. you go. It's had a little tiny mattress. Um, and as I said, no running water, no bathroom. Now, did, there was no running water. So where did you get your, your water? There was a bathroom way at the other end of the hallway. So I would skate. Now, why didn't you move down that area? That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I liked my end of the hallway smelled better. Oh, I so I chose like nice smell mm -hmm. over access because the, where the bathroom was, it was a very stinky bathroom. So sure. I would like skateboard down the hallway to the bathroom or I would like just pee in a bottle. Sure. Um, but it was amazing. Yeah. And it was in the middle of a crack neighborhood. Uh huh. And in the, the time that I lived there, I think two or three people got killed. Mm -hmm. Did you take crack? No. I've never, I've never smoked crack. Uh -huh. At least not that I'm aware of. Uh -huh. I have a lot of blackouts, so uh -huh. it's possible. Maybe even in Fairfield, Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> that night, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. 
I think we better, maybe we better take this to the floor now. Sorry to in interrupt you. Okay. I, uh, I fear That's perfect, because I actually only had one more question, and it was an awkward one. I'll go, I'll go on then. Throw Unlike all these completely non-awkward questions I've been asking. Throw it in. Go on, quickly. What? Do the awkward one really quickly. Oh, okay. What haven't you made or done that you would like to do? I don't, I don't, uh, there's, I'll tell you what it would be. There's a, to print photographs using uh, the lithography process. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's that an seems, awkward question, Mo. That seems like it'd be pretty easy to accomplish. Maybe that. Yeah, it, it might be, but I haven't done that yet. Okay, great. Okay, <coughs> any questions? I, I fear there may be a EDM question coming for David Lynch any minute. A what question? Do you say? Electronic dance music. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. Check. Don't worry, I won't go there. Um, David, you've left us with some fantastic films, and you've also left us some fantastic soundtracks. And paintings. Like Go. Um, what of your soundtracks has surprised you to have a life of their own separate from the film, looking back? What is that? Uh, what soundtracks could, should have a life of their own? What soundtracks to your movies or projects have had a life of their own that has surprised you? Oh, um... Like floating well, none, into the none night. None of them really had a life of their own, I don't think. Oh, the Julie Cruz record? Well, that wasn't a, sound, that wasn't a soundtrack. The Julie Cruz record came first, mm -hmm. and then uh, Falling, uh, I wanted for the theme for uh, Twin Peaks. So, um, I don't know that any of the soundtracks uh, took off on their own. I have a strange question, okay. even though I'm not in the audience. Um, one of my favorite things that you do is sound design. Would it be possible to release a record of your sound design? Certainly. That would be so cool. Because I love, like, if you watch Inland Empire, which we've established is my favorite movie of the last 10 years, the sound design in that is like you could almost like turn off the TV and just listen to the movie and it's beautiful. Like even like take out the dialogue track and just listen to the sound design and it's beautiful. But why would you want to turn off the visual? <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying that one could. One could do that, yeah. It's, it's one of the rare movies that would even be appreciated by a blind person. Well, that's beautiful. Pearson, Casablanca News. Can you talk a little bit about your um, foundation? And I know it started in 2005. Can you talk a little bit about that? I thought I did mention it. Um, I just arrived 15 minutes ago. I apologize. Oh, okay. at, at the beginning, there was a nice... Yeah, at the beginning, I talked about the foundation. So um, I think they've, they've heard that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, David. Hello. Mark Lewis. I always wanted to uh, ask this question. What inspired the movie Eraserhead? And the second part would be, if you were inspired by electronic dance music, what movie would you create from being inspired by the music today? I always say my greatest influence was the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And that uh, city and things that happened there uh, inspired or the beginning of the script for Eraserhead. And sometimes when we listen to music, ideas come out of the music. And you never know when it's going to happen. And it doesn't mean that it's the first time you hear the music. 
on Blue Velvet, I, I, I never liked Bobby Vinton's version of Blue Velvet. And then one time I heard it, but ideas started coming out of that song. So music is, as you all know, so fantastic and it's abstract. And if you're in a certain place and a certain mood and a thing comes on, it can, it can jump so much emotionally and mentally. It's, it's a magical medium. But I don't know what ideas would come out if I listened to that, but um, I would like to give it a try. A question for you, David. Um, I live in LA now, I'm looking for a good club. Where, where is that club in Mulholland Drive, Silencio? I've been looking everywhere for it. <laughs> it's in our minds. It's in our minds. There's a club in France called Celestio, Silencio, and uh, you could get on a plane and go over there. <laughs> <laughs> you should open it here. It looks, looks like a riot. <laughs> okay, one more, one more question from the floor. It's actually just kind of nice sitting here, isn't it? Yeah, it is nice. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Moby, I'm Daniel Harris with Dance Paths. Hi. And noticed that you're headlining on Lightning in a Bottle this year and wanted to get your take on the whole transformational dance movement and specifically your interest in it. Um, transformational dance movement meaning the more sort of like the conscious? Correct, burn yeah. culture, you know, the, I mean obviously. I mean, one you, of the things I've always loved about electronic music or dance music is it can exist in so many different realms at the same time. Like it can be pop music, it can be underground, it can be expansive, it can be limited. Um, but Lightning in a Bottle in particular, and some of these other festivals, um, like I went to Lightning in a Bottle just as a, a patron last year, and I, it's this amazing festival where, let's say half the festival is music, so there's DJs, there's some bands, but it's very sort of consciousness expanding. Um, and then there's a big art component, um, a lot of good vegan food, and uh, meditation classes, talks by different spiritual leaders, and I. I mean, I'm a hippie who, even I'm bald, uh, who lives in Southern California. So I, I, I just, I love that. I mean, I like, of course, like the festivals that are just about music are great. But when there's an element of like community, food, spirituality, art, I find that really inspiring. So, I mean, Lightning in a Bottle is one of the festivals that even if I wasn't DJing at it, I'd still go. And so the, and with music in general, like I, I was thinking about this yesterday because I was watching this documentary, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and, and I was just thinking that there's so much room for elect music in general, electronic music and dance music, to be more expansive, you know, and to really, to be longer, to be more trance-inducing, um, and to enable people to sort of like reach other states of consciousness just you know, not through narcotics, but just through music. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Okay. I think that's a good place to end. So, David Lynch, Moby, thank you. Great thank start. You very much.